Um, before I read the scripture this morning, it is, it, it's going to be Nehemiah 13, verses 23 and following. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. I'm going to read a little disclaimer on this, um, just because of the kind of passages. So I, I, I don't want to go on too long on this. So here it is. I'm going to read a passage about Nehemiah, um, how he cleansed the people of Israel from, quote, everything foreign. If you are an immigrant, <laughs> or for any reason don't feel like the majority of people would consider you a native, don't let this passage make you nervous. Um, I'm not going to preach against you, or that the Bible is— don't think that the Bible is against you. As I'll explain later, foreign in this passage means someone who rejects the Lord and worships foreign gods that are detestable rivals to our loyalty and companionship with the Lord. So when you hear the language of this passage, don't let it make you feel unwanted or attacked. God certainly attacks us in his word, um, but not for things we can't change. He confronts us about what we believe and what we do. Okay? So, let's look at this passage, Nehemiah 13, 23 and following. In those days, I, that's Nehemiah, saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. And I confronted them— Oh, sorry. And I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, quote, You shall not give your daughters to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, on account of such women, among the nations, among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, Foreign women made even him to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehida, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleanse them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and the Levites, each to his work, and I provided for the wood offerings at the appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, oh my God, for good. Man, as I wrote this, I just want to do like a five-week series on it because there's so much to deal with here, um, especially because um, what this is teaching is so straightforward. It's through the entire Bibles, but it's also personally deeply offensive to the modern person, partly because we misunderstand it, and partly because we understand it. Um, I was at a, a young person retreat not too long ago, like high school, college kind of age, and um, I was talking to a young man who had, who had kind of grown up in the faith, had kind of walked away in his behavior and actions and so on, and then kind of had recommitted his life to Jesus. And he asked me if I could help him in the discussions he was having with his girlfriend about Jesus. He's like, my, my girlfriend's not a believer. I'm a believer. I'm trying to, like, talk to her about Jesus. And some of the conversations go well, some don't. Like, what do you think about this? And so I was, like, trying to help him, like, figure out what's helpful and I'm helpful in sharing Jesus with his girlfriend. At one point, I just stopped. I was like, hey, can I just stop for a second? Yeah. Do, do you know that Scripture teaches that if you belong to the Lord— you must marry someone, if you marry, someone who belongs to the Lord. You can't marry a non-believer. And therefore, since dating is determining whether you have the natural and personal affection for someone you already know is a suitable companion, you shouldn't date a non-Christian. And he just looked at me like a cow staring at a, like, closed gate. He was just like, like, he, he, like he'd never heard such a thing, right? And this is one of the issues with like trying to be like really open and not offend people at church and not say things that are direct teachings in scripture that, that are kind of important, but that we don't want to hurt people's feelings is because like literally our kids grow up and they've never heard such a thing, right? I've met Christians who've never heard that God reserves sexual contact only for within marriage. She's never even heard that. They don't even know, right? And so he was kind of like, really, well, why is that? And we had this really good conversation about why that is, but he'd never heard that it is, right? Also, um, generally speaking, I really love the Bible Project videos. Um, I'm not, so I'm not against that project. I think it's a great project. It's very helpful. We use it in some of our classes in church. One of the videos I think gets it really wrong scholarly-wise is at the end of the book of, of the videos on Ezra and Nehemiah, it says that when you, you get to the end, there's this place where all these people had married foreign women, right? And their kids didn't even speak the language of Judah. That when Ezra and Nehemiah split up those families, 
for the sake of the worship purity of Israel, they did something God didn't want. They, it was a leadership failure. They should have seen into the future and seen that God was creating a more inclusive people and that he wanted all these people brought in, not pushed out. And so again, we have a failure of God's spiritual shepherds. So we look in disappointment to the future where he will bring a shepherd that is Christ, who will understand God's real command of bringing all people together. I think that that's really cool. I just think it's wrong. That's not the way Nehemiah presents his own actions in the book of Nehemiah. He presents them as terrible and yet necessary for the survival of the integrity of God's people in worship. And that that moment, this moment in the end of Ezra and Nehemiah, is one of the most terrible decisions any spiritual leader in the Bible ever has to make. Right? What do you do with families already who have come together, who actually have children, and who by their very nature, because they're dividing up the loyalties of the heart spiritually, are destroying the integrity of the people of God that you came back from Babylon to rebuild. And they choose to split up these families for the most part. And so it's really easy to look at that and be like, okay, this is, this is a bad, this is really bad. Okay, but look, so here's a couple things you need to realize. The first is, is that this idea that somebody who belongs to the Lord must only marry someone who belongs to the Lord is found all through Scripture from the very beginning of Scripture all the way through into the New Testament to the present, right? In the New Testament, right, in the time of Jesus, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, um, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. This specific section is talking about women. This would be just as true for men. Right? But if her husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. It's hard to get more explicit than that. Right? She marry whoever she wants to, provided they're human and male. Right? The only stipulation God puts on who she chooses is that he has to belong to the Lord. The same is true the other way for men. Or whoever you want, provided she's human and female. But she has to belong to the Lord. That leaves— a lot of liberty to you, but keeps one profound criteria out of your hands that you have to obey in. Now, this leads to a second principle, which is a little bit deeper one and applies a little bit more broadly, which is that discipleship is comprehensive. The word comprehensive means in everything, everywhere, completely. Comprehensive means the most complete form of things. So the question is, see, we tend to think of faith as something we believe. That thing we believe is just the thing that we believe, and it may or may not connect with everything else. It's like if you go to like one of those fancy restaurants where everything's a la carte, and you're like, I'd like that for seven and a half dollars, and that for six fifty, and that for three twenty-five, and that for twenty-six forty-two, and you like build yourself a little meal based on what you want, picking each thing individually, right? As opposed to going to a place where you like order a meal and everything is predetermined for you and you just get the whole thing. That's not a la carte. It's everything together, right? Some people believe, based on the concept of understanding what faith is in a shallower sense, that faith is, um, I believe in Jesus for the salvation, for my future salvation, and for the forgiveness of my sins, and for some applications to some things, right? But it's not everything. It doesn't get into everywhere. But that's not really the case. To believe in Jesus in Scripture means to become his disciple. Discipleship is the following and teaching of a master. The concept of having someone who is a master means that you're in a position of a learner to their complete authority, and you take in everything that they're trying to teach you, right? And the relationship is comprehensive. It's, they're not just your professor for, like, sociology, and you listen to them about some things in sociology. No. It's a fully forming relationship of a master to a student, right? And in the, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the first thing that the actual disciples of Jesus called Christianity was not Christianity. Christian or Christianity was a label given by non-Christians to us in the early chapters of Acts, in Acts 13 in particular. What Christians called this thing that we do, believing in Jesus and following him in the Bible, they called it the way, right? Which is kind of funny that the Mandalorian stole that. This is the way, right? Like, Paul said that first, right? I'm a follower of the way. This is what we do. It's a way. Like, it's a way of life. It's a path that we follow. It's complete. It's comprehensive. You cannot imagine that you believe in or belong to Jesus without understanding that knowing him, belonging to him, believing in him is a comprehensive thing. And what that means is, is that when God gives us commandments, they're not just guardrails around our freedom, but all, every commandment God gives has built into it a kind of lesson. And the less you understand the commandment, the more opportunity there is for your wisdom and your faith to be expanded by learning the lesson. But what, the, the important part is only obedient faith looks for the lesson. 
outside of obedient faith, what we do is we intentionally misunderstand the command so that we can dismiss it and feel like we don't really have to obey it. And yet we still want to imagine that we're that we're, we have faith, that we believe, right? So when you look at something like, like, a, like a terribly difficult command, like, listen, if you're a believer, you can only marry a believer, right? Now, that is particularly difficult in a time where, because of, for cultural reasons, there's more women than men in the church, right? But that's the command. Whether you like it or not, that, that is what it is. And so if we're going to face difficult commands, if we're going to recognize that this is an example of a place where we need to realize discipleship is comprehensive, there's three spiritual pursuits we need to realize we have to give ourselves to if we're really going to be disciples of Jesus and not just play around. And the first is, is that we need to reject willful misunderstanding. The first action of our flesh, our indwelling sin, when God gives us a command we don't like, is to find a way to willfully misunderstand it. The second is, we need to actually learn what the mind of Christ is on this thing. How does God think about it? And how do we actually need to change the way we think about it, like the way he thinks about it, so that we can actually believe and see the beauty of it and the goodness and the truth of the thing God is saying, as opposed to what we were previously believing. That's how we are transformed in the renewing of our mind, to quote Romans 12.1. And the third is, is learning from the nature of our humanity. One of the reasons why we don't want to believe what God says is because we— tend to think ideologically rather than humanly, right? We think in an abstraction, like, what should the world be like? What should my life be like? How should I be treated? What should, the, what should I get to, to do? As opposed to what is real and what choices should I make to maximize the creation I'm really in, the situation I'm really in, the nature of my real humanity, so that I can be the best that I can be. Like, listen, you can spend your whole life being angry at God that he did not make you able to fly spontaneously. Maybe he should have. He can fly. Angels can fly. Why can't you fly? It's just like a few more bones and some muscle structure and some feathers or something, right? Like, why can't you fly? Why can't you just naturally, like, metaphysically fly? Like, just using the power of your psionic mind. Like, he's just a bad person. Right? Now, that may sound ridiculous to you. You may be thinking, that's how I was, I've always thought that, Nick. I'm sorry, I just ruined your faith, okay? But like, for, for most of us, we recognize that like, expecting somebody else to do other than what they chose to do with their own freedom towards us is irrational. And that we need to actually take the world as it is, both in God's good creation and in its suffering under the curse. And we need to deal with what's really there. And we need to treat ourselves as we really are. And some of God's commands, they don't make sense ideologically. We don't know why you would do that in a vacuum. But when you understand what you are as a human being, the minute you recognize what you are, how you're influenced, how you develop, what you really want, who you really are, you realize that his command is incredibly wise. And then you'll see its beauty. And then you'll find that motivation that you need to really embrace it fully. So the first is that we um, reject—we need to pursue— rejecting willful misunderstanding. That is, that our sinful hearts plan to revolt against God's commands because of our wounds and our wants. You could say it a bunch of different ways. I'm just trying to alliterate for fun, okay? And what happens is is that because of our wounds, like our hurts and like our issues and our desires, what New Testament, the New Testament calls epithumia, or like desires that are kind of out of control and not doing what they're supposed to do, which is basically all of our desires, okay? Those wounds or hurts— or insecurities, and those desires that are kind of inordinate or out of control are working together to infiltrate our rationality so that our rationality will serve their wants. Okay, the Bible calls that the flesh. And what that means is, is that when God says something like, you may only marry someone who is a believer if you're a believer, what those things say is, well, but what if I don't find somebody like that? Or who, who is he to tell me what to do? Or um, like, this is very intimate. Like, this is about my gender and my sexuality and like my life and my happiness. Like, how can God be making these sorts of commands? Right? And then he goes, oh, rationality. Like, there's got to be a way we can tell God he has no business telling us this. Right? And so the way this kind of works is that our wounds or insecurities, right, lead to us forming some sort of rationalization why this command doesn't make any sense. So pragmatism, for example, a young woman could be like, look, there's just not as many men as women in my church and in most churches I go to. They're just not available. And like, I'm not going to like wait till some other dude leads another dude to Jesus or like, I'm not going to do all this evangelism to lead these dudes to Jesus. Like, I shouldn't be in this position in the first place. Like, I need to be pragmatic. I need to do what I need to do. I need to find a guy. Hopefully he'll be nice enough. I'll get the guy closest to a Christian as possible, okay? Or you could say escapism where like, where we say, maybe that's right, but I can't handle it right now. 
right? So some of you know this, like trying to do your homework or like when you're working at home for like a year and you're trying to do stuff, but your home is full of distractions and you know you need to do your work, but your mind keeps saying, we'll do the work later, but let's play a video game now, right? Once we take, maybe we need to do some self-care. We need a nap, maybe a little snack. And then we'll get back, we'll get right back to this, right? And then what ends up crashing into make sin feel completely justified is inevitability. Look, there's no way you can do this. Like, not doing it's inevitable. And so God is literally asking you to do something that you literally can't do, which is totally irrational and immoral. So you shouldn't have to do it, which then leads to, right, moral superiority. You could, if you want to be snarky, you could say wokeness, right? Like, where you, you literally think you're better than God. You understand it better than God. You understand that he's immoral and that you're more moral and that you see more clearly than him and that he should have never told you to do this in the first place. Or moral independence, the, the libertine or libertarian way, would be like, look, I'm an independent person. I'm my own person. I shouldn't be under this much rule. God is overbearing to think that he can make such commands into these personal places of my life, right? Or some people, if you're really clever, you can be both of those things in the same day, you know, and push God away with both sets of logic. And what I'm trying to tell you is, listen, the New Testament predicts that we will think this way, feel this way, and behave this way. Not because we're super rational, not because we're more moral than God, not because we're more like morally aesthetic than God, that we understand beauty or goodness better than him, but because we're selfish and we're hurt and we're wounded and we have very small views of the world and we haven't really investigated or sought out the truth and wisdom in God's commands. And so they just seem stupid because we are ignorant. And so the first reaction our soul has when we hear stuff like this is, that can't be right. I'm not doing that. That can't be—Nick's that, that, not reading it right. Or like, surely there's another passage in the Bible we can use against this passage, right? And what I'm trying to tell you is, if you want to be a comprehensive disciple, you have to realize that's going to happen in your heart, and you have to actively fight it. And what Scripture teaches is that that part of you that's doing that, what our job is is to put that to death. It says in Scripture, we're meant to crucify that part of us, not listen to it. Here's an example relative to marrying only a believer. You could hear this passage and think what this means is that God is saying you can't marry foreigners. Like it's xenophobic and, and bigotrous. Bigotry? Full of bigotry? Full of bigotries? Let's do that. Bigot, full of bigotries. Right? Or you could think that it's like destructive to like, it's like hateful towards non-Christians. Like, well, what if you're married to a non-Christian already? Like, are you supposed to like divorce them or leave them? Like, like in this Nehemiah passage, you're like, what about like, you know, what if you married somebody you thought they were Christian, then they lost their faith or something? Like, you know, are you supposed to like hate them or like marry somebody else or what? Right? Well, a lot of this is like, we really don't understand what scripture teaches all the way through on this because the passages relative to it are, are like not next to each other. And so in order to know this teaching, you would have had to read the whole Bible and paid attention whilst doing so. Which I know is crazy that we would do that, especially people who've been Christians for like 10 years or more, right? In Scripture, what it actually teaches is one, is that this does not refer to somebody who's, who's married to a non-believer, right? In 1 Corinthians 7, if you read that, read that chapter, it's perfectly explicit that if you're already married and the person you're married to is a non-believer— the unchangeable and irrevocable covenant of promise that you made to that person in marriage takes priority over the choice of who it is. You already chose who it is, right? And so that's behind you. You can't go back to it. And you do have the capacity in the Spirit to be like virtuously and profoundly a Christian in a marriage that has a split faith. But you can't undermine the covenant of marriage and what it represents to that person. So your job is to love them as like deeply to care for them, to serve them, right? Your marriage may not express, like in, like in Ephesians 5, Christ's relationship with the church as both believers inhabiting their role in that, but God has a profound relationship of love and care over creation that doesn't love him, him back spiritually in that sense. And even if your spouse doesn't like you because of your faith and is estranging themselves in your marriage because of your faith, you still have a relationship of love towards them. And Scripture teaches that you're not to leave them, and you're not to, like, fight with them, or cool the relationship, or hurt them, or judge them for that. Scripture's not teaching that. It explicitly teaches against it, right? The second is, is it's not saying you can't marry somebody who's different. Now listen, if you understand humanity, you'll realize that marrying somebody different has its problems, Okay? has its problems. My, my parents were a, were a multicultural marriage. My mom was from Italy. 
My dad was like an American nativist. Got off my, like, they got off the Mayflower, okay? And the interrupting, yelling, emotional Mediterranean culture my mom came from and the stoic British culture my dad came from were not naturally compatible, okay? <laughs> and they got married because they loved each other, okay? And God bless them. You know what I mean? And like a lot of us um, find ourselves that loving people who are very different from us. Sometimes it's just temperament like that or cultural backgrounds. If you're from different families, and you're not really supposed to marry people in the same family, right? So if, you're, if you marry somebody from a different family, you are marrying on some level a cross-cultural person, right? Um, it just depends on how much, right? And so you could add ethnicity into this and race into this and nationality and linguistics and all that kind of stuff. Scripture never says that that is a barrier that you shouldn't marry across. If you want to, look, the only stipulation put on it, other than they are a human in the complementary gender, is that they belong to the Lord. If they belong to the Lord, from there, it's up to you. The only caveat is, if you marry them, you will stay with them as long as you both shall live. So you better think about what you're getting into and whether or not you're going to really do the work that's necessary to make those differences work for you because they'll naturally work against you. So when you marry somebody different from you, you are choosing a harder road in some sense, but also it it can be a very rich road, and it's a choice. Most of life is trade-offs. You marry somebody different from you, they're different from you, so you get things that you don't have, and you're more complimentary in one sense, but the inner interaction and the unity is a little harder, right? You marry someone who's the same as you. You don't get these other abilities and things that are outside of your strengths, but getting along is often easier. Life's full of trade-offs, and you're free to make them, but she must belong to the Lord. Or he. Does that make sense? One commentator says this way, removal of foreigners should not be viewed as racial exclusivism. As always, foreigners could become part of Israel by conversion. That is, When he says foreign, what he means is people who would not become part of Judah. They weren't Jews, and by definition, in that context, it meant that they clung to their foreign idols, they were idolaters by faith, and the faith of those idolaters, God said, was profoundly provoking to him. We'll talk a lot more about that when we get into Ezekiel, right? But one example of this is Ezra and Nehemiah are very similar books. This is talking about one of those kind of situations. So it says, so the Israelites who had turned from the exile ate it. That is the Passover. That is this week, right? The, the Feast of Unleavened Bread that led to the Passover, which became Holy Week, the death and resurrection of Christ, right? And it, it says in the Bible that only circumcised people who be, either are part of the Jewish religion or become part of it can eat the Passover. And this passage says that though there were times where, where Nehemiah said to foreigners, you have no part with us, in this place it says this, together they ate it together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. For seven days, they celebrated with joy the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now see this? From the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. Do you see the idea here? There was some group of people who had not come back as as part of the nation of Judah who decided they wanted to be part of the worship of the God of Israel. They wanted to— and and you you can't add him to your other religions. Right? He's an exclusive, comprehensive God. And so a certain group of people decided that they would come into the Jewish people, though they were foreigners. And what this passage says is that in the most holy festival of the Jewish people, they were embraced with open arms. Those who believed. Because it makes sense. Those who believe can be part of the worship of the God of those beliefs. And those who refuse to believe, it doesn't make sense that it is somehow meaningfully inclusive to include those who don't believe into the worship of of those who believe. Ruth is another great example of this, right? In the book of Ruth, um, you have this woman who's a Moabitess. She is part of this group of people that would be on the outside, literally mentioned in this passage in Nehemiah that they intermarried with. Um, Ruth is not a Jew. She doesn't belong to the Jewish people. And when her husband dies, who was a Jew, um, they had come to Moab. They had fled Israel and left their religious faith behind, right? Or at least their national identity. And when her husband dies and Naomi, the Jewish mother-in-law, goes back to Israel, she says, I'm going too. And, and Naomi says, no, you can't come back. Why? You can't come back as a Moabitess. You'll be a foreigner, a sojourner in a land that is Jewish. Like, it, this, it's better for you to stay as a Moabitess. And she says, no, I will be with you. Your God will be my God. And where you're buried, I'll be buried. Like, she pledges to become one of Naomi's people, the people of God. And so on the basis of that, Naomi says, fine, you can come back with us. And as you read the book of, of um, 
Ruth, one of the things that's noble about Boaz is that Boaz makes sure that, no, that um, Ruth receives all the protections of the law that a woman is afforded so that she's untouched, and he marries her. He chooses her as, a, as his wife. This is a guy who's wealthy. He could have picked any of the young Jewish women around him, and he chose this foreign woman because she was a better Jew than the lot of them. Do you understand? It says that Ruth was a better daughter to Naomi than ten sons could have been to her. And because she was more Jewish, she was more of a believer, she was more committed to the truth and to doing what's good in God's name, he saw her as the one to choose, as the, as the most compatible in the faith, even though she was a Moabitess. Does that make sense? And they are celebrated. Ruth gets her own book, and she's in the line of King David and the Messiah Jesus. So you see, if, if your first impulse was to say, I can, I can blow this off. This, that's just bigotry. That, I, like, if you're a super woke, here's the, thing, here's the problem. God is woker than you, okay? <laughs> like, it, it's not that you're wrong to hate bigotry. Like, no, it's right to hate bigotry. It's right to hate wrongful exclusion. That really is bad, and it's good to think that's bad, right? And so if you, if you first read this, and you didn't know the full biblical context of it, and you were like, that makes me very uncomfortable. I don't think I like that. That's a good feeling. The question is, as a disciple— did you, was, was your impulse to willfully misunderstand or to pursue and investigate why God would say that? Until you found out why and saw the beauty of the thing you thought originally was ugly. See, it's, a, it's a disposition, it's a choice of the heart. And you have to decide what kind of person you're going to be. Do you trust the master that his command is right, even though it sounds crazy, and that you pursue it, and in pursuing it, you then find out that it's good. And many times, in God's commands, you actually have to obey them, like literally do them, before you will really find out their beauty and goodness. That's why we are saved by faith. We're not just forgiven by faith, but everything is by faith because you have to trust God to find out everything we have to find out and to experience everything we're meant to experience. And that always feels like jumping off a cliff. Right? I mean, think about this. 3,000 years ago, or 2,500 years ago in the time of Nehemiah, God was more racially woke on intermarriage than we were 25 years ago. Maybe even now. Think about that. And then the second thing about this applicationally wise is um, the only stipulation God puts on marriage, like if you have like this libertine, like God shouldn't be telling me what to do. Okay, first of all, God's the master. He can tell you what to do. But notice how much he doesn't tell you what to do. He gives you the freedom to make a catastrophic mistake in marrying like a twit or a wanton. As long as they seem to belong to the Lord, you can marry anybody you want. There's one stipulation. And everything else is up to you, right? That's not a lot of— it's only the most needful requirement. He leaves the rest to your stewardship. He's very—he's terrifyingly—he gives you terrifying independence, right? Okay, we're going to have to speed up here. So what do we do? Um, the second thing is, is that you have to learn the mind of Christ. What is the logic and lesson of this command? What is the logic and lesson? What is God trying to teach me with this command that I hate and that I find difficult, right? <clears throat> when you belong to the Lord, when you come to him, by the Spirit, you become one with the Lord. He indwells you personally by his Spirit. He makes you one with himself. The reason your sins are forgiven is because you are united with Christ. And he has taken your sin on himself, and he has given you his own righteousness in that union. In judgment, you can't be separated, and God has justified his son, and so you are justified in union with that son. Your whole salvation, your whole spirituality, your whole eternal future is bound up in the idea that you are in comprehensive and profound union with the Son of God by his Spirit through faith. And God has made the complementary genders of humanity capable of becoming one flesh in comprehensive, permanent covenantal union in this thing that he invented called marriage, which creates the most profound human oneness that can exist. Or let me say it this way, has the potential to create the most profound human oneness that can exist. There are circumstances where there's super profound human oneness outside of marriage, like people who go to war together and stuff like that, okay? That's true. But the possibility of human oneness 
all the way to sexual oneness and procreational oneness that exists between a husband and wife and can is the most profound secondary intimacy, companionship, and it's the most comprehensive human relationship that can exist. Now think about this for a second. If you have this utterly comprehensive relationship with God internally by his spirit, and then you're choosing to enter into another entirely comprehensive and intimate relationship with another human being, should they be compatible or should they be rivals, those two relationships? Do you even have to be a Christian to think that through? I don't think you have to be older than about four years old to think that through. I think the reason why we struggle with it is because of our willful misunderstanding, our desire to be free of any constraints from God. Right? The Lord, if you're a believer, is meant to be your most influential, intimate, and comprehensive companion in an unbreakable covenant. And if you marry, your spouse is meant to be your most influential, intimate, and comprehensive companion, companion in a permanent, unbreakable covenant. Right? Those two unions, and both are gifts of God, right? The one is a free gift for anyone at any moment you can receive right now, and it is better than the other. But he also gives the other, right, human marriage as a gift from him of union and intimacy and comprehensive togetherness, right? And those two are meant to foster one another, and they will either be comprehensive mutual supports of each other, or they will be constantly provoking rivals of each other. Out of love and wisdom, God is telling you to choose a spouse that is more likely to be a comprehensive mutual supporter than someone that is more likely to be a constant pro provoking rival to that intimate relationship that you have with God. And if you don't understand that, it's not just that you don't understand what marriage is meant to be. You may also not really understand all that your relationship with Christ is meant to be. If you understand what both of those unions are, the idea that you would willfully choose for them to be in rivalry with one another becomes unthinkable. Because you'll only really be able to ma maintain the intimacy of one of them. So, what that means is, is that Comprehensive, for a comprehensive disciple in any of our unions, much less our marriage union, we would—no comprehensive disciple wants to set up any rival to God anywhere in their life, much less in one of the most profound comprehensive unions you could possibly have, which is marriage, right? The second is, is that both of these onenesses, if we receive them, are gifts of God, but they're meant to foster each other, right? So the one and greatest is the one we can all receive right now, which is union with God in Christ by His Spirit. The other we might experience, it may break or die, and, and it's, it's less permanent in some ways, but it is profoundly great and can be, which is marriage, and they're supposed to foster one another to produce a confluence so that both are more together. Right? And so by choosing compatibility rather than rivalry, we get more than the two. They multiply with one another rather than detract from one another, right? And it's also important as a comprehensive disciple to realize if we understand how deep a thing it is to be in companionship with the Lord by his Spirit, we, it would feel unthinkable. Like if we, in our desire to have intimacy with somebody we would choose to marry, most people who are in love want the maximum amount of intimacy you could possibly have with the other person. I mean, that's what, that, when we talk about the storm of emotions we call being in love, what that really is, is the, the drive of natural affection to have a larger experience of oneness with the other person, right? We often think of that relation in relationship to sexual oneness, and that is one form of it. But part of it is like staying up for hours talking, and, right, especially if you restrain yourself from sexual actions, what happens is that desire comes out in other ways. That's why, like, if you can keep yourself in what Augustine called continence, which I love as a description of being able to not have sex with somebody, um, what that leads to— I remember when I was dating my wife, like, we would talk all night. Like, we would talk for six, seven hours, right? Because we couldn't get our hands on each other. Otherwise, we'd have been done paying attention to each other in 20 minutes, 
right? It, because there's this drive to know each other better on every level, in every way, as comprehensively as possible. That's what being in love feels like. It's what it means, and it's supposed to be that way. And it's ultimately supposed to drive to this comprehensive, complete, permanent union of mutual influence and desire and hope and love, which is marriage. Does that make sense? And if you understand how deeply the Lord is meant to be in you, how deeply and comprehensive his relationship is with you, it becomes increasingly unthinkable to think that you can have complete intimacy with someone who doesn't share one of your deepest and most intimate commitments and relationships. It's your identity. Why would you seek intimacy with somebody who could never share that deepest identity? You wouldn't, right? Lastly and quickly, um, we need to learn the nature of our humanity. I'm going to say this really really quick, but it's important. You have to also apply this to what it means to be a human being. If you're ideological and abstract about your understanding of the world, it will ruin your ability to be a real human in your real life. What that means is is that for relational—so we're relational beings and we're malleable beings, which means we're deeply influenced by everything around us. And so if you want to decide who you're going to be, you don't choose ideologically who you're going to be. You choose your influences, and they will make you the thing that you're going to be. That's how humans really work. If you think you can decide to be a Christian and then do all these non-Christian things and have totally non-Christian relationships and like celebrate non-Christian things of beauty and all that kind of stuff, and you think you'll be a Christian, you're not going to be a Christian. You will be whatever you place in the ethical and aesthetic place in your life. The moral and what you think is moral and beautiful and what you rehearse in that space is how your character will be shaped. Right? And so, for example, let me, let me say, you have to realize in terms of influence that one decision is another decision. So here's, here's an example in my life right now. So I want to study from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., okay? I study and I work out in that two-hour block, Okay? And then from 8 to 9, I try to spend that with my family. So those two hours I'm trying to study. Now, my, my physical constitution requires me to sleep about eight hours. I just know that after 43 years of life, and I hate that about myself. I wish I was the sleepless elite that could sleep three hours, but I'm not. I'll just get sick. So I have to sleep eight hours, and I have to get up at 5.50 to really be at my desk at 6, which means I have to go to bed at 10 sharp, which means I have to start going to bed at 9.45, which means I can't start watching TV with my kids at 9.50 or 9.30. Because then I'm not going to bed at 9.45. I'm not going to be asleep a little after 10. And I can't get up at 5.50, which means I'm not going to be at my desk at 6. Does that make sense? So therefore, as a human creature, the decision to start watching TV with my kids at 9.30 is the decision to not be at my desk at 6 the next morning. Do you understand that? It is the decision to do that. Okay, your whole life is like that. Everything in your life is like that. Everything about who you're going to become and what you are and who you want to be and how you're— is based on what influences you're choosing for yourself and what choice now leads to what choice then. Do you understand? What you find attractive in a potential spouse. How you nurture your spouse who you're already married to. Like, how you interact in everything in your life and what choices you're making in the present are dictating who you're going to be in the future. And part of wisdom, part of really being a disciple of Jesus, is realizing that you are incarnate— as the image of God. You're in flesh. You're a human being. And you have to bake that all into how you are a disciple. And once you realize that, commands of God that made no sense to you before start to make perfect sense. Because why couldn't you marry a non-Christian? You'll just stay a Christian. They'll be a non-Christian. You're in love with them. It doesn't matter. You'll, you'll have a family, but you'll be a Christian, and your spouse will not be a Christian. Your kids will freely choose which faith they, they want, and it'll really be up to whether or not you're a good Christian, and that's all there is to it. Who really cares, right? That is, abs- that is an abstract way to look at human beings that doesn't have to do with how humans actually function, right? Think about what Nehemiah said. He said, you guys, think about Solomon. Solomon was pure of heart. He was a great man. God had given him incredible wisdom. God appeared to him twice. He gave him peace. He gave him success. He gave him everything he wanted. And what Solomon did with his wisdom was he realized that if he married foreign women, he could make treaties with nations around him. And so he married a bunch of foreign princesses who all were deeply committed to their foreign gods, who wanted to bring the worship of those foreign gods into their house. And they, as women who have incredible influence over their husbands— influenced his heart over time to be more, more progressive, more open, more pluralistic, realizing you can worship a lot of gods and really care about them. And he gave his heart over to foreign gods. He's like, Nehemiah's like, you guys, he was better than you. 
He was better than you. He was stronger than you. He was smarter than you. He was wiser than you. God had given him all kinds of resources. He made him king over everything, and God loved him, right? Like, it's, it's not like, like, you can't say, look, God loves me. He's going to keep me. He's, look, he's going to keep me on the path. It's fine. I'm fine, because God loves me. God loved Solomon! Solomon's, like, aberration had nothing to do with the fact that God didn't love him enough. It had to do that he picked his influences. He chose, and he should have known, and he did know, that one decision was the other decision. He knew it, but he willfully misunderstood. He didn't want to know it. And he explains it late in his life in the book of Ecclesiastes. He told himself he was seeking wisdom, but he wasn't. And see, you and I have to realize that, like, we need to know the mind of Christ, the logic of why he tells us things in terms of that intimacy. But also we need to keep learning more about what it means to be a human being and how we get formed and shaped the way we do so that we, we understand the wisdom of God's commandments even when we think ideologically we wish they were otherwise. Right? This all comes down to the fact of will you or will you not choose to trust the master when he tells you something you don't agree with? You have a choice when he does that. You can choose to willfully misunderstand it in your spiritual ignorance. And out of your wounds and your wants, construct a rationalization that can lead you to feel like you're superior to his command in one way or another. Or you can choose by faith to know that the one who's spoken this to you is trustworthy. He loves you dearly, and he seeks to teach you a lesson experientially through the commandment so deeply that you will remember it as part of yourself forever which can only be done through the pain of experience in acquiring wisdom. Does that make sense? And it's important to recognize this because as we feel somewhat embittered by the fact that God is calling us through such a path of difficulty and suffering to find the truth, God was willing to go through a path of incredible difficulty and suffering to display the truth. Do you understand? Nobody went through a greater path of difficulty and suffering than Jesus the Christ. Nobody. And he didn't do it to find out the truth. He did it to display the truth to us. That, that God the Father was so absolutely trustworthy that the plan of his own crucifixion of his son was worth displaying the truth to you in order to not just make you able to receive it by giving you his spirit because of his death and resurrection, but by displaying how trustworthy he is, how beautiful his work, even in the death of his son, so that you would have the courage to say, what God did even in the death of his son, he turned into this great thing that the son was pleased to live out in his death and resurrection so that he would follow the father's will to the end and to show us that no matter what God called us to, no matter what he commanded us, that doing it was worth it and we would find his wisdom and we'd be formed as his people through it. Whether that is for you choosing a spouse accepting his limitation that they must belong to the Lord, or if you are married to a non-believing spouse, accepting his limitation that you are to love and cherish and serve that non-believing spouse. Whatever it is. We're going um, to have a little bit of time of worship, and I, I just hope that something in this you will not willfully misunderstand, but you will choose to pursue into deeper understanding. Maybe you should write it down. Maybe you should think about it for a minute. Maybe you should pray specifically to God about how you're going to deal with it, what you're going to do with it. Remember, this, this sermon makes no difference if you forget it in 10 minutes. It makes no difference. You have to choose and take the personal responsibility for how you're going to respond to what you've heard, right? That came through me, but we recognize it's from the scriptures, right? And then we're going to have a, a short AMA at the end and ask me anything, and you can— you can send in questions through the highpointchurch.org slash live chat feed and so on if you want to ask some questions. Let's pray. God, you know how much more I wanted to say about this to give it context. So much I want people to understand so that they can understand so that they can understand in ever-widening circles of how you work through these things, and I just, time escapes us. Um, but I pray that you would come by your Spirit and you would grant faith that you would work in us to have a courage to follow you into commandments that we would naturally want to intentionally misunderstand and throw aside. Help us to be forced to face our wounds and our wants because of what you've spoken into our lives so we can kill indwelling sin, so we can seek healing in the places where we're hurt, 
so we can become more your disciple in these choices that we make and so that we can experience the blessing of your wisdom flowing through our lives and that that blessing would actually not just be something we, we hoard selfishly, but would be a generous transmission to the world around us about how good it is to live according to your wisdom and to believe the truths that you've revealed. I pray that we would, that in this somehow we would cherish Christ and that we would see Jesus in this and his willingness to obey you in everything and his willingness to display the goodness of obeying you in everything and, his, and the joy that sent him to the cross and resurrection. And I pray that we would be able to follow him in that. I pray in Jesus' name.